Thanks. All right. Uh, our next speaker is Edo Iroldi from our Harvard uh, Statistics Department. Um, I thank the organizer very much for having me here. And I want to thank uh, Rich Schiffer in particular for encouraging everyone to uh, take math out of the slides. In my case, it's been a very helpful process. So let's see. How do we move forward here? Oh, yeah, good. All right, so like the other speaker, I also have an introductory slide where I'm going to give the message away, essentially. Um, and when we talk about optimal design of experiments uh, in the presence of network interference, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, uh, there are sort of two approaches to optimal design. There's a model-based approach um, started by Kiefer, or you know, Kiefer is one of the main exponents of this approach. And the one thing to keep in mind is that in the optimal design, in the model-based approach, you get one solution back. And then there's the other school of thought, uh, Fisher and Kempthorne later on, which um, sort of pursues randomization-based optimal design. And there, uh, you are looking for a set of optimal randomizations because you actually want to use one of them in practice and you think that having some randomness, some uh, at, at the moment of carrying out your experiment is going to protect you from biases and from confounders. Um, I'm going to define what I, what I mean by network interference effects, both intuitively, conceptually, and one of the points of the talk is that there are a number of ways people talk about interference. There's a number, of even more ways that we can um, mathematically formulate uh, the problem of interference, and uh, there's something to learn there. And then I'm going to talk about optimal design, and our solution to, to to design optimal experiments is a two-stage solution. We have access to, in this particular problem formulation I'll talk about, we have access to one very large network. We're going to treat the network as a pre-intervention, uh, pre-treatment covariate. And we are we're going to summarize the observed network with the network model. And that will simplify um, a lot of calculations and uh, get around a few problems I'll be mentioning. And then using the network model, we will find a set of randomizations that both maximizes the identification of an effect we're, we're interested in, in estimating and minimizes the variance of, of, um, of the estimator. Okay? So <clears throat> I plan to, to walk you through uh, in a few results. And I, this talk is pretty introductory, I should say. Uh, so my goal here is to raise some issues that have not been discussed, at least in print, at length. And I think um, they should be uh, considered to, to come up with good design principles. And then we'll talk about optimal uh, design. Okay. So what is network interference? So intuitively, there's several ways we can think about this. Here is just a, a very simple example. So there's a situation where the outcome of interest measured on, on an individual, for example, Joe's final grade, depends on interventions or treatment that do not involve Joe. For example, uh, Joe's study buddies get private tutoring. Well, that doesn't uh, involve Joe, but somehow has an effect on the outcome. Or some other people talk about situations where uh, the outcome of interest measured on Joe is connected to outcomes of others. For example, the final grade of Joe is, you know, uh, a function or is sort of related to uh, the final grade of Joe's study buddies. And so in, in this simple example on education, so the key is that there are connections among students. And these connections, or, you know, we'll talk about later a network of who studies with whom, for example, drives the dependence between outcomes and events or the dependence uh, among outcomes, OK? So that's a very intuitive definition. Now, conceptually, we can translate this uh, example into distinct mathematical formulations. And that's, that's where some of the subtleties start to, to come in. So think of yi as the final grade of student i. We'll call that the outcome. 
and think of ZI, whether student I gets private tutoring. We'll call that intervention or a treatment, sort of interchangeably. Okay, so now the mathematical formulations are, are listed below. For example, we talk about interference, or people write about interference proper, when the outcome of Joe is a function of the treatment Joe receives and the treatment uh, Joe's studies buddies receive. We talk about network correlated outcomes, and there's a whole theory on optimal design and estimation for uh, opti uh, network correlated outcome situations where Joe's final grade is a function of the final grade of Joe's studies bodies. And there's combinations, okay? But in, in all of these uh, formalisms, like in the intuitive definitions, connections and covariates, which I won't really focus on in this, in this talk, play a role in defining these scenarios, okay? So that's important. So where do causal interference effect come up, or what are the sort of applications I'm thinking about when I, when I, when I work on optimal design? So here's our, here are a few. One is education on edX, so massive open online courses, and the idea is that uh, as, a, as a teacher, you have the opportunity to design collaborative assignments. Okay, so you, you can actually decide who is gonna work with whom on a given problem every week for maybe 12 weeks or longer, and so you can design study groups to maximize everyone's score, okay? That would be one application. Um, in healthcare interventions I've been involved with, so there are disease prevention campaigns, think of Ebola or think of malaria as the two main diseases people are, are trying to, to prevent with this type of campaigns, at the leverage social structure, okay? For example, if the elder in the village has some knowledge about how to, um, prevent a disease, well, he might actually spread it around and people in the village might listen, these sort of things. Uh, or you can have a social coupon where the person who gets a coupon has uh, a discount for a mosquito net and there's also a discount for a, an additional person and he or she can share the coupon with. There are smoking prevention programs in high schools that also uh, essentially try to leverage peer influence. So the, in the state of Washington, the Hutch as a famous uh, Hutch uh, study prevention program, tens of millions of dollars have been uh, poured into this program, into the valuation of this program. Peer influence is obviously a big component. Um, advertising on social media, that's uh, very hot right now. Uh, and again, in, on advertising on social media, you wanna pay as li the least amount of money possible when showing the advertisement, so if you had an understanding of how this interference works, well, you could show uh, ads to the right people and then it would also affect purchasing behavior of their friends, let's say, okay? And there, there are different types of, of interference here. So in political campaigns, you try to leverage interference to increase volunteer time, donation, voter turnout. I think James Fowler will talk about that tomorrow. Um, and there's also, you know, when you design repeated auction on the internet, well, there the network is slightly more subtle. It's not obvious, but uh, you know, there's a there's a notion of interference exactly uh, along the lines we're discussing here that applies there as well. So why is interference so interesting? So you know, the applied aspect is is sort of obvious, but why a lot of people are really interested in trying to get it? So from an intellectual perspective. I feel it is the intellectual frontier or one of them in causal inference. So that for 50 years or more of work on causal inference, we assume it away, we're not interested, and now this assumption is no longer tenable in a number of applications we care about. So that's exciting. From an applied perspective, so not only we want to control for interference when estimating the effect of an intervention, which you know there's literature for that, uh, but we want to estimate the effect of interference and leverage these effects for affecting future events and outcomes. And so that's what's exciting. That once you get, um, like Bernard was saying, once you, you understand the causal mechanism, you can, you can leverage it and try to get people to do things, apparently. Okay, so what's the key point here? So the key point is that there are several intuitive notions of interference, uh, but they translate into distinct mathematical formulations and even distinct causal effects. Even in a situation where the observations are the same, the experiments are the same, and so it is important to, to have an understanding of 
you know, which notion you care about and how it translates into, into a mathematical problem. Why? Because all these different formulations require different design and analysis strategies. And that's also what makes interference the frontier in some sense. So we don't really have, you know, there's a lot of people working on different aspects of it, but we don't have a comprehensive understanding on how all the solutions and how all the situations relate and so on and so forth. And so here I'm just going to focus on what I refer to as network interference uh, and in a situation where I do have this graph, script G, and then I have outcomes, yi on units i, and these outcomes I'm going to assume are a function of the treatment I give to unit i and the treatment I give to units in the neighborhood of i. So n, n sub i here is the neighborhood of unit i defined by the graph. Now I'm going to talk about design principles, and I'm going to focus on how to design the inferential target. I'm not going to talk about how to design the experiment yet, but just how to design the inferential target, and I'm going to talk about alternative approaches to estimating such a, uh, inferential targets, even, even when I'm focused on just this narrower notion of interference I, write, I wrote up there, okay? Right. So I'm going to go step back for a second and you know, remind everyone about one of the approaches to causal inter inference using potential outcomes. Luckily, uh, Bean has already and Jazz already reviewed some of this for me. So the fundamental object here is the table of potential outcomes. Yi is a function of bold Z, so now Z is no longer the treatment I assign to unit I, it's the vector of size M, because I have M units in my population, so it's a binary vector of size M, it tells who is treated and who is not treated. So I runs over units, so I have M rows, and capital Z run over all possible treatment assignments. So there's a lot of columns. The typical assumption is the assumption of no interference. So sattva is one way to call it, individualized treatment response is another way to call it, and there's you know, all sorts of acronyms that go, but essentially the no interference assumption assumes that the potential outcome for YI is only a function of the treatment you give to individual I. That simplifies things a lot. And in particular, all the relevant outcomes for, for unit I are just two, whether or not you assign the treatment to this person or control, okay? And so the table of potential outcomes simplifies to having M rows, one for each of the units in the population, and two columns. And now the inferential targets, the quantities we want to estimate, some people call them estimates, right, are just functions of this table. For example, an inferential target could be the effect of treatment on unit I is just given by this difference, YI when the, YI is treated, and Y minus YI when I is not treated. So these are called potential outcomes because potential outcomes because in practice we can only either treat or not treat a person and so one of these two will be unobserved, okay? But that's sort of one example of an inferential target. Now, that inferential target is not estimable, okay? It's very hard to, to get at that inferential target with one randomization. So estimable, esti estimable inferential targets are often defined as averages over units and over treatment assignments. So one popular example is the average treatment effect, uh, which um, previous speakers also talked about. So the average treatment effect, or ATE, is just defined as an average of these differences, um, where the average is over units and is over randomizations. And so we can have simple restrictions, so this average is over two sets of indices, we can sort of restrict these two sets of indices. And the simple restrictions, you know, people are familiar with uh, on this type of inferential targets may be dictated by the question. For example, I want the average treatment effect uh, of private tutoring for male freshmen at Harvard. So here I'm restricting the set of units I'm averaging over. Or it could be the average treatment effect for treatment allocation strategies with 50% treated unit and 50% untreated unit. So in this case, I'm restricting the assignments. Okay. So these are things people are, are familiar with. And, and now we're going to move to a situation where, you know, there's a network that enters the picture. It is f for the purpose of this, you know, few slides, we're going to consider that we observe it and we believe that that's the source of interference for us. Okay. So now there are different assumptions we can make. So the assumption, for example, of interference, and there's other names. Uh, in the one would be individualized treatment with reference groups or stable unit treatment of, on neighbors, value assumptions. But the assumption basically boils down to what we were writing down before, 
why i, the potential, the potential outcome for unit i, is a function of the treatment I give to unit i and is a function of the treatment in the neighborhood of unit i when n sub i, the neighborhood, is defined by this graph I have access to. So now the, the table doesn't simplify as much as before, the table of uh, potential outcomes. Now if you look at rho i for unit i, you have different number of rel relevant outcomes for this unit, okay, as a function of the size of the neighborhood. So if you have three friends or seven friends or 25 friends, and let's say, for example, I'm interested in um, exposing uh, or, uh, a unit to, to treat a neighborhood where, when the unit itself is not treated, then I have a number of, of situations. And so the, the way to visualize this table is you have still have M columns, but now you have a different number, sorry, you have M rows, one for each unit, and you have different number of columns. So it's sort of like a ragged array, okay? So we also need to introduce some more language. And you know, before, in the classical situation, we have treated and control. Here we're going to have treatment, exposed, and control. OK, so in this example, let's say unit I is the unit I'm, I'm interested in right now, is exposed if it has three treated neighborhood, neighbors, OK? So even if there's like 25 columns for the row in the, potential outcome in the potential outcome table for this unit, if you think about it a little bit, what actually happens, there's only four possible situations that can happen, okay? So the unit could be in control, and here I'm showing just an example of what that means like the, the, in the black, in the, so the unit I is in the center here, okay, the, the five uh, situations are all the same. Uh, I color coded them. So in the black situation, it's called control. The unit I is not treated. None of its neighbors are treated. Then treated as before is a case where unit I is treated, but none of the neighbors are treated. That's a blue situation. Then I have a situation when unit I is exposed, and I define exposed exposure here as having three treated neighbors. So in this case, unit I is in control, but three of the five neighbors are in treatment, and then you can have treatment, the, the unit could be treated and exposed, and so, you know, that's a purple situation right there, okay? So, in this new situation, again, we have a slightly more complicated potential outcome table, and, you know, we have several situations that we have to, to care about, and these are the four situations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just not to be confused, I'm not saying that these are all the possible treatment assignments that you can have, obviously. I can decide to have one, one neighbor treated, two neighbor treated, they can sort of decide this different set of neighbors get treated. Those are all the columns for this unit I. But what I'm saying is that the unit itself will be either in control or in treatment or exposed or treated and exposed. These are the four situations, okay? So in some sense, we do have some simplification there. Now we can talk about the inferential targets. So as before, estimable inferential targets are still often defined as averages over units and over randomization, so not much changes there. For example, the, ever, the average interference effect here, AIE, could be the average effect of being exposed to three treated neighbors. That's just one example, okay? So what is the role of the observed interference? What is the role of the graph here? And what I'm gonna argue and I'm gonna try and, and show you is that we need to consider a new set of combinatorial restrictions due to this pretreatment observed graph, and we need to impose this restriction for statistical considerations. And so these are not restrictions we are imposing uh, at the estimation stage yet. We're just restriction that we're in imposing on the inferential target. Because if we have a quantity that's well defined, then estimation will be easier. That's the idea. And so we have to introduce some other language. So there's egos and there's alters. So let's see how this works. So in the example here, I have an inferential target is the average interference effect of being three, ex three exposed, like before. Okay, the inferential target immediately identifies units as eligible to be subjected to this effect of interest, being three exposed or not. Mm -hmm. And so we're called the eligible units egos, and those are the bold units again. And um, the not eligible, um, units alters. So why would you not be eligible? Well, if you only have two neighbors, you cannot be three exposed, right? That's the idea. And see here is a, is a sample, uh, a, a very simple network 
Here, there are like all different units. In the previous slide, I had four different situations for unit I. Here, the units are different. And so these four egos are actually different units. And what I'm showing here is that, um, you know, some of them will be treated, some of them will be exposed, some of them will be in control, and some of them will be treated and exposed. Um, so the other sort of way this, uh, uh, the, the graph comes into play is that for any given treatment assignment, only some egos are relevant. Okay, why? Well, you know, if I'm trying to find this average interference effect of being three exposed, in here, I'm gonna take the difference between the outcome on the red unit and the outcome on the, on the black unit. So the, the blue and the purple units are not really relevant, okay? So there's a notion of egos and alters, and the average is gonna be only over the egos, and there's a notion of, um, only in a further subset of egos may be relevant for an inferential target of interest. And so these are restrictions or types of restrictions on egos and alters. Then there's a, another set of restrictions <clears throat> um, for different reasons. Okay, so, so here, not all treatment and location, not all, all bold Z vectors essentially, lead to a balanced numbers of red and black egos or even one of each. So here in the, in the left cartoon network example, I'm showing a situation where because of this particular bold Z vector, I get only two egos that I'm gonna supposedly take the difference of, but they're both treated. None of them is in control, so the difference is, is not defined, okay? Some networks are generally problematic, so in this other cartoon network on the right here, I still would like to, to have a three exposed ego and a three exposed and a control ego, but you know, you can sort of see that it's kind of hard. In fact, it's impossible to, to find the randomization that will actually accomplish that, okay? And so the, the, the story, or the, the point here is that balanced treatment assignments and egos with reasonable probability of being included in the inferential target are needed for designing quantities of interest inferential targets that are estimable precisely, okay? Okay, so here's a good design pipeline, you know, optimal for this average interference effect. You, you make some, some assumptions about interference, like we did. The table of science, you know, uh, is now a rugged array, and it's all, every, every row has only a, a relevant set of assignments, so already there's some restriction on the set of assignments come out of there, of the assumption. Then you're gonna declare the causal inference target or targets of interest that immediately helps you identify egos and alters, and then you're gonna further restrict randomization and egos to increase balance and probability of inclusions of essentially all the egos that are participating um, in defining the inferential target. That's sort of the design stage because we haven't touched, we haven't actually randomized anything, but we haven't um, run the experiment. And then you, know, you can randomize and re-randomize to insulate neighborhoods and so on and so forth, allocate treatment, collect outcome, and finally estimate um, the inferential target. We won't really talk about estimation, okay? I'll just point you to some papers. Okay, <clears throat> so the key point here so far is that restricting the inferential targets in different ways is a good design principle when interference is present, and just to give you a concrete example of why we care. So in computational social science, we often target many small causal effects, okay? And the typical assertion you hear executives at least making is that, oh, big data will help. We have so much data, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna estimate everything precisely, okay? But as, we, as I try to illustrate to you, finite population inference based on this observed network interference leads to combinatorial issues. So you can imagine, those are all cartoon networks, but when you, we deal with the large network, all sort of configuration happens, okay? And, and big data, the, mor the morale of the story is, cannot really help reduce standard errors if we neglect these combinatorial issues during the design phase. Okay, so some cautionary message here. So that's a situation where we have an observed network. So now I wanna talk about absolutely very briefly about a couple of other situations where um, conditioning or relying on an observed network is not perhaps the best way to do, to, to go about estimating either interference. So 
first, a, a short story. So there, there are multiple aspects of social structure. So a few years back, we looked at the overlap between declared social relations in an online social media platform and social relations revealed by multiple users being co-tagged in, in uploaded pictures. There are two different networks, right? So ideally, you think there should be a lot of overlap. We focused on undergrads at 130 US colleges, and we found surprisingly little overlap. Now, we, we were not planning on running an experiment, so we didn't really care. It was just surprising. There were, there were a lot of issues with the analysis because uh, the differential coverage could have been due to early stages of the system, many users not being tagged, not many users were using the upload picture feature, and so on and so forth, so we sort of forgot about it. Then, a couple of years uh, ago, I was involved uh, with, some, with some colleagues in designing and analyzing a, a disease prevention campaign for malaria in a number of small villages in, in South America. And so I was very proud that my colleague decided to spend some money to elicit a social network pre-intervention. I thought, you know, that would solve a lot of our problems because finally we could condition, we could design the right estimates, we could find the effect we wanted. And then what happened is that after the intervention, most of the social coupons were passed outside of the social network. So we're like flabbergasted, like, what's going on? Right? And then, you know, you can think about it and in a small village, you, you can rationalize, everyone knows everyone else, it's a real, a really a fully connected social structure, the lack of alignment between this elicited network and the target notion of infer interference was really the problem. We, we really don't know what type of network we elicited, or what we tried to elicit some sort of social relation closeness, right, and so on and so forth. And so, when you have an available network, it may not help, so it depends. The network has to be aligned, okay? The notion of interference in that the network is capturing has to be aligned with the notion of interference you are trying to estimate. So that's sort of the lesson, the lesson learned. So what we did as a, as a reaction is that we couldn't really use the pretreatment social network. And, you know, um, like just talk about separation between design and analysis, we couldn't even decide to collapse the pretreatment social network with the post-treatment revealed interaction because that would complicate issues, okay? So, you know, the, we developed an alternative formalism which we call experimentally revealed interference. There were some situations where, you know, like I said, the, the network that's available to you may not be, be well suited for interference effect of interest. And so here's the, how the um, alternative formalism works. So pre-intervention, you don't have access to a social network, so all your units are there. There is a social structure, those are the gray lines in the left cartoon, the pre-intervention cartoon. And what happens in this formalism is whenever you put somebody in treatment, you are gonna be able to see some, if not all, of the social connections. And if you put somebody in control, even they, they have a rich social structure, you're not gonna be able to observe anything about social connections, okay? So there's pros and cons. The, 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 the sort of, the price to pay is that only minimally restricted inferential targets are now estimable because you cannot do all these design uh, activities using the network available to you as a pretreatment covariate. But on the other hand, you can get valid causal estimates, okay? And so that's something of a different flavor, still getting an interference. And then there's even a different situation where you may want to impute aspects of the network. And so this is, you know, just a slide about a different situation where um, key aspects of interference may not be available to you. Okay, so here is, a, is an application or um, an analysis we did for the Transport for Lon London. They have Oyster card data, so all the tap-in and tap-outs of people in the system. And it's like overland, under, so, uh, overground, underground, and Dockland light rail. So we analyzed about three months of data. We had uh, 11 million unique IDs and about six million taps per day. So it was a lot of taps. Um, and the target that we wanted to estimate was well, what's the effect of on, uh, line and station closures on traffic from and to other lines and other stations, sort of congestions, right? These were engineers who were interested in, in planning and you know deciding how many uh, alternative buses to put on, uh, on the road and so on and so forth. What's nice is that it's a closed system because everything uh, uses Oyster card data in London. And we had the map for, for this 
underground, overground, and light rail. And we also had passenger survey data to sort of assist a little bit with the network tomography problem. But ev eventually what we ended up doing was to impute origin destination traffic volumes on this network to get at interference effects. Okay, and so this is a third situation where you don't have access to the network, you have access to maybe partial information about it, and you can do some imputation and then leverage the imputed network, not the observed network, for getting at inter interference. Okay, so I'm sort of ready to pass on to optimal design here. So the idea so far is that similar design principle apply to observational studies. There are matching strategies we've developed for these settings we're not gonna talk about. Estimation strategies to get at these restricted targets exist, I haven't talked about that. What I've sort of tried to, to convey here, the message is that there's a lot of combinatorial issues in finite population inference. There may be lack of alignment between network data and the target notion of interference. There's uncertainty, which we haven't talked about, and there's heterogeneity in the observed network. Okay. So our solution to, to get out of this hole was, okay, let's try and use a model to describe network interference. And so here we sort of move on to the design part, the optimal design part. Um, as I said before, there's two approaches, the Kiefer approach, model the surface, complex surface, several criteria for optimality, you're just gonna optimize, you get one solution. <clears throat> That's not what we're trying to do. Here, we're gonna make assumptions on complexity of potential outcomes, minimize, and the goal is to minimize the variance of an estimator for a given inferential target with a class of optimal randomizations. Okay, so, so first we're gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about stage one, what kind of model we're using and why, and then I'm gonna tell you about stage two, what do you actually do with this model. Okay, so for modeling heterogeneity, we use essentially a stochastic block model, which is a coarser summary of the network. If you look at this network picture over here, there's like blue nodes, red nodes, and, and green nodes, and the idea is that you're gonna, the block model is gonna have two parameters, two sets of parameters. One is called nodes to blocks map, and tells you which nodes are in which block, and the second is a block to block connectivity sort of matrix, and you know, something I wanna stress, this is not a clustering model, because if you look at the C, C, you know, the bottom right element of that block model is zero, and if you look at the green nodes, they're not connected to each other, so a clustering model would certainly not put them together. Here we're trying to leverage this notion of structurally equivalent nodes. If nodes are structurally equivalent, equivalent in terms of the connectivity pattern, we can put them together uh, in a block. Okay, so this is how uh, the model is. So, so what can you do with this model? Well, if you posit that your network G, script G, is generated by a fairly general process, an exchangeable graph process, and, you know, calligraphic G, then you can use the block model to build a stochastic block model approximation, which I'll, I'll denote with that calligraphic G underscore, uh, you know, uh, SBA, that is stochastic block model approximation. And we can prove that this type of approximation is a good estimate consistent for this type of processes from this type of network data. So here, I'm just illustrating on the, on the left, there's a, the adjacency matrix. Now, it looks dense, it's not really dense, but I had to increase the pixel uh, sort of to, to show you anything in there. So the point is there's an ordered, very complicated combinatorial structure, and there's one step in this estimation process which is involves sorting or matching, so we sort of reorder, we, we commit to a permutation of the nodes we believe in, and then we do a two-dimensional network histogram, and so if the uh, original matrix in this case is, for example, 500 by 500, the block model is, you know, 90 by 90 or something like that. So, you know, and in, in real cases we have like tens of millions of nodes, you can still have maybe a thousand blocks or less. So a comparative performance analysis here is gonna show you that there's, you know, for different type of processes, there's different ways of reconstructing them. GSBA, the stochastic block model approximation is this stepwise constant way of doing that. Um, there's the spectral methods and you know, things we did, like total variation minimization that are arguably getting you less error, but why, why do we stick to the stochastic block model approximation? Well, first, it reduces dimensionality from a continuous or possibly smooth function to the stepwise function, and these are just examples, um, and leads to analytical insights. So you know, there are difficult tasks for arbitrary network to do, 
Typically, people compute approximate answers on the exact graph, but now we can compute exact answers on this approximation. And the idea is that we're going to leverage just this strategy to get at optimal uh, treatment allocation. Okay, so the setup here is uh, I'm going to have interference as before. There's going to be an observed network and a graph model, and I'm going to assume additive treatment, and there's some assumptions. Um, I have two slides. So the optimal design procedure is as follows. You're first you're going to map these restricted inferential targets to this estimated effect of interest. And then you're going to estimate uh, the process using a stochastic block model approximation. Then you're going to find analytical expression for some quantities, key quantities, like the distribution of treated nodes in, um, in the neighborhood of each unit. And then you can find you can solve an optimization problem and find these optimal allocation strategies. I'm just going to now skip a couple of slides here. But the one slide I want to show you is that once you do that, the reason why you're going to optimally estimate interference effects is because this optimization is going to lead, look at the bottom right panel, to a multimodal distribution, so a lot of coverage on this percent of neighbors treated. And so that's sort of like the inside that comes out of this optimal allocation strategy. And um, I'm just going to conclude, since I'm in negative time here. Uh, so big data, as I said, cannot overcome poor experimental design, especially when targets, targeting small interference effects. There are some good design principle we talked about is essentially restricting the inferential target. And we talked about an optimal design strategy using a block model and optimizing for a randomization using the block model. And I would be remiss if I didn't take a second to acknowledge my collaborators, in particular Don Rubin, my colleague, and our students, Charles Mansky, who was sort of instrumental in getting me on this path, and IIS, the Sloan Foundation and Basic Research, and at ONR for funding the work. Thank you. <laughs>